We've all heard the Bible verses that talk about Muhammad. Muhammad is in Deuteronomy. He's in the Song of Solomon. He's in Isaiah. He's in the Gospel of John. Of course, here on this channel and other channels that deal with Islam, we have gone full Sharia on these arguments. We have beheaded them. We have mutilated them. We have incinerated them like the charred remains of the Qurans that Uthman burned. We have destroyed them like Al-Hajjaj destroyed his old Qurans after his recension. We have sunk them like Egypt sunk its Qurans in the early 1920s. In short, we have destroyed these arguments almost as much as Muslims have destroyed their own scripture throughout history. But we need to give Muslims credit where credit is due. You see, believe it or not, Muslims have dropped some of the worst arguments about Muhammad in the Bible. As we go through a couple of these examples, you simply won't believe them. So I'm going to convince you, Muslim style. You see, all you need to do is browse some Muslim YouTube channels. Whether it's kutbas or recitations of the Quran, the Muslim world seems to be convinced by almost anything as long as the production value is there, as long as there is bravado, as long as there is boldness and confidence, and as long as there are some effects like reverb or voices droning in the background. Let's take a look. And Muslims, look at the description of your Rasul. I saw a man of striking appearance. His belly wasn't protruding, nor was his head disproportionate and small. In his eyes, there was a contrast. The dark was immensely dark. The white was excessively white and his eyelashes were long, and his neck was elegantly long. So he describes Muhammad's facial features in detail. Then he says, The Sahaba say, when we used to sit at, hi at his feet, two feelings conflicting would come on the heart. The first one, you wanted to look at him. You wanted to behold the majesty of his face. And when you wanted to look up, shyness used to overtake you, so you used to look down. Amr ibn al-As says, I sat with him many times, but if you ask me to describe his face, I can't describe it. So on the one hand, we have a hilariously detailed description of Muhammad's facial features, obviously the result of an extended staring contest. And on the other hand, the companions were so shy that when they wanted to look up at Muhammad, they would immediately look back down. When you wanted to look up, shyness used to overtake you, so you used to look down. I sat with him many times, but if you ask me to describe his face, I can't describe it. And his eyelashes were long, I can't describe it. And his neck was elegantly long, I can't describe it. The dark was immensely dark, I can't describe it. The white was excessively white, I can't describe it. This is not logical. So, such an exalted and sweet level of logic. But for many Muslims, content doesn't matter. This obviously embellished and contradictory description of Muhammad has thousands of likes and comments and hundreds of thousands of views by Muslims just eating it up. It's all about presentation. So let me up my presentation, add some bravado, some confidence, and some reverb. Otherwise, you just wouldn't believe this verse is about Muhammad. And God created two great lights from the light of our Lord Muhammad, blessed be he. Does this verse seem like a stretch? Well, it actually makes perfect sense. Haven't you heard what happened when Ishmael was born? Gabriel came to Abraham and gave him the good news that God would provide him with a child through Hagar, a son, through whom would appear a prophet by the name of Muhammad, the seal of the prophets. When Hagar gave birth to Ishmael, his face shone like the moon with the light of our prophet Muhammad. Ishmael's face shone like the moon with the light of Muhammad. Now that makes me wonder, what did Muhammad's face look like compared to the moon? So I looked at his face and I looked at the moon and I looked at his face and I looked at the moon and I looked at his face and I looked at the moon. Never mind, I'm tired of waiting around to find out. But apparently Muhammad, who made light during the creation of the world and made Ishmael's face shine, stayed 
lit all of his human life as well. Aisha radiallahu anha says, I was sewing with the needle. My needle dropped in the dark. I couldn't find it. He moved his face close and I swear, bout of the radiance of his face, I found my needle. It all makes sense. So, such an exalted and sweet level of logic. Ready for another verse? I thought so. You might think that Numbers 24:17 says this. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. But you would be wrong. It actually says, Behold, a star appeared from the family of Ishmael, and a tribe of Arabs sustained him. Often when Muslims in this period were reading Muhammad into the text, they claimed that they were reading the true or the pure Torah. The Quran says Muhammad's in the Bible. The Quran can't be wrong, therefore the Bible is corrupted. Now, what's a corrupted Bible mean? Well, it means that you can read Muhammad into the text whenever you want, wherever you want, however you want. Now, another verse about Muhammad, very similar to the argument from sound about Muhammad being in the Song of Solomon, we have Hosea 9. What will you do on the day of the appointed festival and on the day of the feast of the Lord? For behold, they are going away from destruction, but Egypt shall gather them, Memphis shall bury them. Nettles shall possess their precious things, Mahmad of silver, thorns shall be in their tents. I know you heard it, Mahmad. Sounds like Muhammad, right? The argument from sound. Surely no one is dumb enough to suggest that a word that sounds like Muhammad must be Muhammad, right? Song of Solomon, chapter number 5, verse number 16. I'm quoting in Hebrew. Such an exalted and sweet level of logic. So coherently logical. So they keep on going in circles here and there, you know, like that, like that. Using this coherent logic, we can come up with all sorts of brilliant insights. And these are unclean to you among the swarming things that swarm on the ground, the mole, the rat, the mouse, great lizard of any kind. The word for mouse in Hebrew is akbar, which is identical in sound to a common Muslim phrase. Therefore, when Muslims peacefully shout Allahu Akbar like their prophet did when he ambushed the village of Khaybar, as they were going out in their fields to work, Muslims are proclaiming their God is a mouse. Now, Muslims, if you don't like that conclusion, that's fine. Stop using the exact same logic when you try to find Muhammad in the Bible using the argument from sound. So coherently logical. Now, what allowed Muslims throughout the 13th and 14th centuries especially to make these sorts of claims? It seems highly likely that these scripture twisters took advantage of their readers' lack of knowledge and general lack of availability of the biblical text. Now, are arguments from those centuries any different from the arguments that Muslims use today? Let's look at Deuteronomy 18 as an example. Here's an article written by Ajaz Ahmad that someone pointed out to me recently. He quotes Deuteronomy 18.18 as the last argument for Muhammad in the Bible. He says the word for brethren is achihim. But this is actually not the word for brethren. What he has there in Hebrew is brother in plural construct. It's a construct phrase. It's the Hebrew word brother in construct with a third person plural pronoun. He doesn't know the difference between a Hebrew word, which is clearly what he says, and a Hebrew phrase. Now you just know intuitively that if someone doesn't even know the difference between a word and a phrase in Hebrew, then you definitely want to take their word for what the Hebrew means. But we know with certainty that the Arabs are the kinsmen, the brothers, cousins, etc. Also, the brothers are the Arabs, and we know this with certainty from someone who doesn't even know the difference between a Hebrew word and a construct phrase. That makes a lot of sense because when I go back earlier in the chapter, in verse 2, I see that the Levites will have no inheritance among their brothers. I'm sure that the Levites needed to be told that they would not have an inheritance among the Arabs. Thank you, Moses, Captain Obvious. Or what about Deuteronomy 17:15? You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Since we know with certainty that the brothers are the Arabs, then that means that the Israelites only elected kings from Ishmael's descendants, right? Only if you're a Muslim clown trying to read Muhammad into Deuteronomy. Oh, and then there's the Quran. We gave him Isaac and Jacob and placed in his descendants prophethood and scripture. Ijaz continues, the evidence is quite overwhelming. Previously in his article, he has discussed the Gospel of John, some of the dumbest comments you'll read on John's Gospel. Just imagine 
Zakir Naik in text form. So they keep on going in circles here and there, you know, like that, like that. So the evidence isn't overwhelming, but the evidence is overwhelmed by Muslims who have a presupposition for believing that Muhammad is in the Bible because the Quran tells them so. So this argument about Deuteronomy 18 is still around, kind of depending on which Muslim apologist you ask. Yes, the Bible does talk about a progressive revelation, which is why it talks about the upcoming prophet. That's what Deuteronomy chapter 18 says, that there was going to be one of the ways to, to tell a true prophet is through prophecy. So it seems we can find Muhammad in Deuteronomy 18, kind of, or maybe we can't. If I were to choose a verse in the Bible, especially the Old Testament, that I could confidently say, you know, it speaks about Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So if, 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 if I'm being completely honest with you, I wouldn't choose Deuteronomy 18. Maybe. So you wouldn't choose it? So it's no, not I, would, that's why I, I wouldn't choose you, that one. Start 18, I would choose uh, Isaiah 42. It talks about the upcoming Prophet. That's what Deuteronomy chapter 18 says. So this argument that was popular centuries ago is still around today. And the old argument about Muhammad being in Hosea 9 is no better than saying Muhammad is in Song of Solomon 5. Also, writing Muhammad's name into Genesis 1 is no better than scratching Yahweh out of Isaiah 42, writing Muhammad's name in there instead, and then saying, look, I found Muhammad in the Bible. But today, the Bible is much more widely available. Muslims can no longer capitalize on the ignorance of their readers, yet their arguments haven't changed one bit. So what's a Muslim to do when they're trying to justify Allah's words in the Quran about Muhammad being mentioned in the Bible? There are a number of options. Option one, claim the Bible is corrupted. Of course, for Muslims, this causes a problem because it requires them to ignore a number of verses in the Quran. There, Allah promises to be the guardian of the reminder, the same word that's used to describe the previous scriptures as well. Notice especially Surah 21, 7, where the Quran commands its hearers to ask the people of the reminder if they do not know. We see the same thing in Surah 16, 43. One thinks that Allah would have put some sort of a disclaimer in the Quran if these books were corrupted, instead of simply endorsing them over and over and over, which is exactly what we see. Notice that Allah sent down the Torah, and whoever does not judge by what's in it is an unbeliever. In Surah 547, let the people of the gospel judge by the gospel. The Quran has no idea that the Bible is corrupted. The closest you get is people who write scripture with their own hands as opposed to corrupting previous scriptures, and those who twist meanings with their tongues. As Arthur Drogue says, the Quran itself speaks only of punning with words rather than wholesale corruption. For some important Muslim scholars like Razi and Kortbi, the so-called corruption of the Bible was a matter of misinterpretation or concealing verses. This is echoed by some modern Muslim scholars as well. Dr. Atai states, But when you compare the two textual traditions, Ben Asher and Ben Khayyim, there are some variations in wording, but the vast, vast majority of differences are differences in what are called niqut in Hebrew, or vowel notations, vowel pointings. So the bottom line is the Hebrew Bible that was um, existent in 7th century Arabia is basically the same as the Hebrew Bible used today. The question is then why are you giving authenticity to the Gospels? Be that's a good question, because I think the Quran does. Very good. I think the Quran does. And from Professor Abdullah Said, the authorized scriptures of Jews and Christians remain very much today as they existed at the time of the Prophet. It is difficult to argue that the Quranic references to the Torah and Gospel were only to the pure Torah and Gospel, as existed at the time of Moses and Jesus, respectively. If the texts have remained more or less as they were in the 7th century CE, the reverence the Quran has shown them at the time should be retained even today. Many interpreters of the Quran, from Tabri to Razi to Ibn Taymiyyah and even Qutb, appear to be inclined to share this view. The wholesale dismissive attitude held by many Muslims in the modern period towards the scriptures of Judaism and Christianity do not seem to have the support of either the Quran or the major figures of the Tafsir. But this is a problem. The Bible, both before and after Muhammad, has something in common. It doesn't talk about Muhammad. In fact, it explicitly condemns Muhammad-like figures. 
And this is where the problem gets most significant. When the Quran claims to confirm prior scriptures, and when it claims that Muhammad is in them, what specifically does it think it's talking about? Perhaps another reason for the spread of this unique literature referring to Muslim reconstructions of the true Bible was the fact that Arabic translations of the Bible were not easily available to Muslim authors up to the 13th century. Often, however, these alleged quotations contain Midrashic and other Jewish material taken by Muslim authors to be part of the Torah itself. Think about that last statement. Muslim authors thought that extra-biblical Jewish material was part of the Torah. What else does that sound like? Can anyone think of the name of a book that claims over and over and over again to affirm the Torah and the Gospel, but in reality spends very little time interacting with them, instead interacting with rabbinic tradition and all sorts of other extra-biblical material? That's right the Quran, and the Quran never gives us an indication that it knows the difference between biblical and extra-biblical material. It's ironic, then, that Muslims want to claim on the basis of their book, which knows very little about the Bible, that the Bible is corrupted. Here's what the Quran knows about the Bible, little to nothing, just like Muslims for the first six centuries of Islam and just like modern Muslims today. Now let's look at the second option for Muslims who want to defend their God's claims about Muhammad in the Bible. I've said it before, finding Muhammad in the Bible is like the carnival game, whack-a-mole. What do you do when you can't defend an argument? Well, if you're intellectually dishonest, just change the argument to something else. Look, there's Muhammad in the Song of Solomon. No, actually, he's in Deuteronomy. Wait, he's in Isaiah. Just kidding. He's actually in the Gospel of John. And on and on it goes. Muslims tell us about Muhammad in the Bible. We go full Sharia on those arguments, and he just pops up somewhere else. If these arguments seem like complete nonsense to you, it's because they are. Centuries-old nonsense that originated in an era of biblical illiteracy. And even today, it's very clear from the Muslim world that they haven't made a single step towards biblical literacy since then.